and welcome to the Current Science and Technology Podcast from the Museum of Science in Boston. I'm your host, Susan Heilman, and every week we bring you interviews with guest researchers and our museum staff covering science and technology in depth. Today we'll learn more about the physics of bubbles and diamonds, two of nature's most beautiful phenomenons. Pop goes the bubble. A seemingly simple act, but take a closer look sometime. It's much more elegant and complex than originally thought. Here to tell us more about his bubble research is J.C. Bird, a graduate student at the Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Hi, J.C. Hi, Susan. Basically, you study how bubbles pop. How did you originally even get into that kind of research? Well, the lab I work in at Harvard, Howard Stone's lab, studies fluid dynamics. And prior to this research, I was studying how drops splash and how they spread on surfaces. So late one night, I was trying to see if, if we could extend the work to, to bubbles. And along with one of the co-authors, Laurent, we were just playing around with, with how bubbles would spread on different surfaces. What happened is we, we failed miserably. And the bubbles didn't spread on the surfaces at all like we had hoped they would, but instead made these hemispherical caps, bubbles that were hemispherical in shape. And what we noticed was when these bubbles popped, they made this distinct ring of smaller bubbles all around the outside. We kind of looked at each other, not really sure what was going on, why this was happening. And it turned out to be incredibly reproducible. And so we decided to, to show our advisor the next morning, Howard, and, and he had no idea what was going on, encouraged us to, to keep on looking at it. And so we then started to use a little bit more sophisticated techniques to, to try to really figure out what was causing this bubble bursting phenomenon. So you said a little bit more sophisticated. You didn't just walk around your lab blowing bubbles and seeing how they popped on a surface. Well, we, we kind of did that. We did a few different things. One, rather than using our original Dawn detergent in water, we tried to, to use a surfactant, sort of a soap, to, to stabilize the bubble. We decided to use a surfactant that was more well-known. And we then controlled it, the experiments by being quite careful about how we were blowing the bubbles and how we were then popping the bubbles. We then also used a high-speed camera to, to film how the bubbles burst. And a high-speed camera is it's like a microscope for time. It allows us to, to look at how a bubble pops on a much faster time scale. So bubbles themselves pop within a few milliseconds, which is much, much faster than we can actually see with the naked eye. But by, by using a high-speed camera, we can then go back frame by frame, and this is about 3,000 times faster than a normal video camera, so you can really see what's happening as the bubble collapses. So it was a bit more sophisticated in that you did try to equalize how all your bubbles look so you could see the same type of bubble over and over again with the high-speed camera. So what were some of the things that you initially saw with the bubble? You mentioned before that it pops in a very uniform, reproducible pattern. That's right. So the end result, what you can actually see with the eye, occurs much later. But it turns out that within that time, within the, the seconds or the hundreds of seconds that we, we need to see what happens, there's really two distinct steps. So first you have this hemispherical bubble that's sitting on a surface, and then how do you pop it? Do you use your finger or do you use some sort of specialized instrument? We tended to use a tip of a needle, just okay. to be precise. But you can do this with your finger quite easily, as long as it's dry. And what's the initial part of this process? So the, the first stage is that the bubble will start to retract. Because the bubble has a lot of surface area, it has a lot of surface energy as well. To minimize the surface energy, the bubble will try to reduce the amount of surface area. And one way of doing this is by retracting. The part where it pops, the hole, will start to grow. From the middle outward. From the, the middle outward, or the, the top of the bubble where it's popped. And the liquid itself of the bubble is only on the outside of the bubble. It's all air on the inside. The bubble is predominantly air, although we did use different gases on the inside just to see the effects of the internal gas. That air is surrounded by a film that's roughly 10 microns in thickness. And then around that is the, the atmospheric air. It turns out that when you have a curved interface, there's actually a higher pressure on the inside than on the outside. So on, on any bubble that we have, there's a higher pressure inside the bubble than, than outside the bubble because the bubble is curved. What happens is that when, when you start with a hole at the top and it starts to open up, the higher pressure air on the inside can start to escape out of the bubble so that now 
the pressure on the inside and the outside is equilibrated. What this means is that the bubble starts to fold inward because now there's no, no longer a higher pressure allowing it to, to maintain a hemispherical shape. So as it's collapsing inward, it's also retracting, and the two effects together create a brim around the edge of the bubble as it's retracting, and then this brim can then trap a torus or, or donut of air. So now it looks like basically a donut-shaped bubble. There's just air around in a ring, but not actually in the center. That's correct. And what happens at that point is a second step. Here, the donut of air becomes unstable. And just like the jet from a faucet, how if you put a thin stream of, of water from your faucet at the bottom, often you'll, you'll notice that it will break up into lots of little droplets. And that's because a, a cylinder is unstable. It will then break up into a series of different drops. And the reason behind this is that the surface area is actually smaller for having multiple spheres than it is to have one cylinder. And because the surface energy is related to the surface area, reducing the surface area reduces the total energy of the system. And less energy is better. Less energy is preferred. Okay. And so similarly, when there's a, a torus of air, it's, it's also cylindrical in its cross-section. And in the same reasons, it'll break up into, in this case, lots of, of little bubbles. Okay, so this donut-shaped bubble, because it's slightly unstable, then it wants to break down even more into these more stable little tiny little bubbles. That's right. The goal is to minimize the surface area. And so the idea that, that a cylinder or a torus will break up into to lots of little droplets, or in our case, bubbles, that part is, is fairly well understood. And there's not many surprises in that phenomenon. What is surprising is how that torus got there in the first place. So most of our work really tried to identify what was causing this trapped air. So this step between the hemispherical bubble into that donut shape. That's right. Most of the, the previous work had really focused on what happens early on in terms of a bubble collapsing and didn't really look at what was going on at later times or near the, the boundary of the, the interface itself. And what we've, we've done is really tried to distill what are the fundamental ingredients that you would need to see this phenomenon that we, we observe with the high-speed cameras. So to do that, we created a numerical model, which the goal was just to, to be as simple as possible. And we, we realized that we would need to include surface tension. Uh, this was driving the, the flow. And we, we recognized gravity was not important in our case. Interesting. The other ingredients that we found were important was the inertia that was required to, to accelerate the, the rim as it collapses. And it also turns out that the internal gas plays a small role in how fast it can escape out of the bubble. You mentioned that you use different types of gases besides just natural air. Air. And that's right. We also used helium, carbon dioxide, and, and nitrogen. And so you still got the same results? We got the same results. And the, the speeds were all about the same, too, because in those cases, the speed is dictated by the surface tension and the inertia. What was different was the size of the secondary bubbles. So what changed was how much the film would, in a sense, implode, how much it would go inward as it was collapsing. With the, the lighter gases, the film could go in much faster, or there wasn't as much pressure pushing back on the film. So you ended up with, with larger secondary bubbles. As cool as it is to see how bubbles pop and to know more about how bubbles pop, are there any practical applications, actually, for this research? There are. It turns out that bubbles are important in a variety of different industries as well as in the environment. When bubbles pop on a liquid surface, they end up creating a, a dimple, which can create a jet of, of water going upwards. And this is what happens in, in a soft drink. So if you pour uh, some soda into a glass, sometimes what you might notice is some spray coming up, and this can get your nose a little wet. What's happening is that you have these bubbles from carbon dioxide coming up to the surface, and then when they pop, that change in surface energy right at the surface creates a lot of energy. It creates a jet that comes upward that can detach into droplets. Oh, so it's, just, it's from the bubbles, those splashes. That's right. Splashes. The, the aerosols are from the, the bubbles bursting. And this has been known for about 50 years. What our work shows is that these larger bubbles, ones that are around a centimeter, are often discounted because they don't make these, these aerosols. 
But what we show is that they can create lots of daughter bubbles around the outside, and each of those can then create these aerosols going up into the atmosphere. The aerosols themselves have been transfer whatever is, is close to the surface into the air. If that's bacteria or viruses in a swimming pool, then those become atomized to, to the aerosols that we can actually inhale and get sick. And those have been implicated in disease transfer. On, on a much larger scale, across the, the ocean, enormous numbers of bubbles pop every second. And along with those bubbles, dissolved salt and gases are transferred from, from the water into the atmosphere. So it's important not just to know how the bubbles actually pop, but then how whatever's inside of those bubbles, whatever is aerosolized, how that actually reaches out into the world. That's right. This is a, a good mechanism, a very efficient mechanism, to create small aerosols over liquid surfaces. I think one of the coolest parts about this research is that anyone can actually observe a bubble popping. So I could essentially go home today and look at a bubble that's on the side of a glass, and I could actually pop it and then see it form these, this ring of little bubbles. That's right. It is very universal and, and quite accessible. What we found is, is easiest to observe this is to have an isolated bubble. And it's not that it doesn't occur when you have lots of bubbles together, but it's hard to really see what's happening, that you have these daughter bubbles. So I find it easiest just to use a straw. Uh, the smaller, the, the better. Then if you take some soapy solution, you can then blow a bubble that's not surrounded by other bubbles onto to a glass or, or other solid surface. At that point, I find it, it easiest. I get impatient, so I pop it from the top. And often at that point, you'll probably notice a ring of, of small bubbles around the outside. Cool. Well, I'm going to be sure to go home and actually check that out. I saw the videos that you had taken, but I'm just curious to be able to do it and see it for myself. So thanks for coming in, JC, and telling us all about your bubble research. Thank you so much, Susan. Diamonds are a girl's best friend but they may also be important to physicists. Tom Babinek, a graduate student at Harvard University's School of Engineering and Applied Science, is here to tell us why. Hi, Tom. Good afternoon. Diamonds are beautiful and all, but aren't they just pretty gems for looking at? Why would a physicist be interested in them? It's very interesting. It's true. When we think of diamonds, we, we think of gems, and we think of the four Cs, color, cut, clarity, and carrot. We're basically, we're interested in how beautiful they are. But actually, they, they possess a wide variety of really ex outstanding material properties that make them useful for some industrial and technological applications. And what are some of those properties that they have, not how beautiful they are? Well, they're, of course, very, very hard. That's to start. They actually define the hardest material you can come up with on, on the mineralogical hardness scale. So they're used as abrasives to cut and polish and machine things. So okay, that's one. like on the edge of a saw or something like that's that. That's right, exactly. Or a drill bit or something like this. They're transparent, and they can be used in optics in very extreme environments. For example, in lasers that have really, really, really high operating powers that would damage any other material, um, stuff like this. And the thing that we're interested in is in the Lunker Lab at Harvard University is is doing optics with the things that you can put inside diamond that actually will emit light. And these are, these are called luminescent centers or color centers. Okay, so you're taking a chunk of diamond, some, a large piece of diamond, and putting something inside of it? Well, that, so that's one way. Sometimes when you get a diamond, it will have these, these luminescent centers, these defect centers that will emit light. It can actually na have them naturally. The other circumstances that you can actually introduce artificially these light emitting uh, defect centers, these luminescent centers, that's done with something called ion implantation. So diamond is basically a, a crystal made of carbon, but you can implant n nitrogen or boron or chromium, all sorts of materials. And when they work their way in into the diamond lattice, they, they can be used as a, a, a source of light. So when you say a source of light, is that what gives a diamond its color? If it has one of these imperfections in it, a diamond won't look clearish, whitish, but it'll actually look blue or pink, and that's because of something like boron or chromium that's inside of it? 
when we speak of color in diamond in this circumstance, we, there's sort of two processes that can happen. One is that the diamond can ab just absorb light. So, you, for example, you send white light through a diamond and it'll absorb all colors but red, so the diamond looks red. The other circumstance that we're looking at is where you, you have the center and you can excite it because it, it's basically like an atom. It's like the, the fundamental building block of matter. It's got its own sort of electronic structure. And when you excite it, it can give off light of colors that are very characteristic to that particular defect center. So that, that's sort of an emission process rather than an absorption one. Oh, okay. And so are you just looking for diamonds that naturally occur this way? I would imagine that's probably pretty hard to find. Or can you do the other process where you can actually put your own imperfections into a diamond? Right. So well, when we started, and that what prompted me to be here today, we, we were using diamonds that had the defect centers in them already, that these were just a natural byproduct of the crystal growth process. So these are not, these are not diamonds that come out of a volcano. They're synthetic diamonds that are, are grown in a lab somewhere else, and you can buy them, and they have these light emitting centers in them. So were they purposely put in them, or those are they were just naturally occurring defects? They're just they're just there. Okay. And in the future, some of the things the group are is looking into is now that we're making devices. We, it's some of the things maybe we'll talk about today are these wire waveguides, these nano wire waveguides. Now that we have these sort of the structures, some of the structures, we can think about introducing the color intentionally and engineering, adding a degree of complexity in the engineering process. What do you do with these diamonds once you make them or have them? What we did is, that was sort of fun, is we took a diamond and we made very small wires out of them. So what my colleague Birgit Hausman, also in the Lunkar lab at Harvard, what she did was she basically, she put circular particles on the top of the diamond surface and then, then she etched down into the crystal. And the way the etching works is that the diamond that's uncovered, that's unex that doesn't have any sort of mask on top of it, that all gets eaten away. And the, the diamond that's underneath the circular mask, that's untouched. So when you, put, you take a diamond, you put these particles on top of it, these circular particles, you etch down into the diamond, and what you get is, of course, sort of a forest of tubes standing vertically on top of the surface of a diamond crystal. Are these diamonds that then have that light-emitting imperfection in them? That's right. So the crystal that we took, that the processing was done on, that has these, these defects naturally, these light-emitting luminescent centers naturally. So these luminescent centers naturally exist in the crystal that we started with, and then we etch down into it, and some of them, after the processing, remain in the wires. And what do you do with these wires now? That's right. So now what we have is we have a light emitter, we have these defect centers, and some of them are embedded in these wires and the wires act as basically like a waveguide or as sort of an antenna that steers and directs the mission from the defect center out the top. And that's really important because what people want to do is develop sort of information processing schemes based on the, the properties of this defect center. And in order to do that, you need to be able to collect as many photons from it as possible, collect as much light from it as possible. And when that, when that defect is inside a bulk crystal, the majority of light emitted by it is either emitted directly downward or is lost in total internal reflection at the top surface. So when you look at these things in a bulk crystal, they're very dim, they're hard to see, everything is very hard. But when you focus them in these wires... But now we put them in the wire, the light that's emitted, most of it goes out the top, and that's right where the microscopes that are used to study them exist. And so it's sort of an antenna that's funneling all the mission from a lot of the mission from this thing out the top right to our system. So that's sort of the purpose. It, it basically makes an efficient light emitting device based on diamond. How do you get the light to be emitted? How do you excite the sure. imperfection? That's strongly dependent on the particular defect. So the defects themselves will have a certain absorption and emission spectrum. So what we do is we excite the wire or the, the defect with a green laser. It excites the atom, and after a while, it decays, and it gives off energy, and it does that in the form of a photon. We looked at a couple figures of merit for what we, what basically it's called a single photon source. So the waveguides have only one light emitting center in them, not like 100 or 1,000 or a million, but only one. And as a result, one photon comes out of the device at a time, 
we looked at how much power you have to do to saturate its response, how much green laser light you have to irradiate this thing with in order to get as many photons from it as you possibly can. And when you're doing that, how many photons do you get? Is it 10 or is it 100 or is it a million? And it turned out that because of the nanostructuring, because we made these waveguides, these w nanowires, we could get an order of magnitude more light out and at an order of magnitude less power. So it's an order of magnitude more efficient source. And what are some of the uses for a single photon emitter? So until very recently, it was, it was mostly an academic question. The reason people are interested in this is because in the future, people envision a variety of information processing schemes that is both computation and communication. But in the future, our hope are that sort of this will be a natural new environment for research towards this field to be done. Recently, people are, are, are starting to actually develop companies and develop systems to communicate information that is bits of information in the properties of, of single photon. Maybe someday it'll be a real technology. Yeah, so being able to describe the, how to make this structure in the first place is really it's useful. Quite cool. And you've added another possible application for it and being able to use it as a single photon emitter. So thanks for sharing your research with us today. Thank you very much. That's it for this week's show, but be sure to come back next time for more of the latest in science and technology. This podcast is a production of Current Science and Technology at the Museum of Science in Boston, part of the Boston community for over 175 years. For more information, visit our website at www.mos.org slash CST or email us at podcast at mos.org. Thanks for listening. Thank you.